Hello there, it is June 29, 2023, and welcome to Cancer Update 17. The topic of today's conversation is you, and how you have been able to help me in several ways already. So this, this video is a celebration of you. Now, let's go through why that is the case. There, apart from all of the messages of um, incredible support, and there have been plenty of those, there have also been a number of specific um, scientifically based advice that have come my way. And I just want to um, thank, thank you all, um, but, but very specifically to um, the people that have been involved in the two things that I'm about to describe. The first thing is several people were recommend specific foods to me. And uh, two of those foods were garlic and, and turmeric. And I had already done some research at that stage and I was aware of um, some people that had done scientific research on um, what I would describe as effectively anti-cancer foods. And um, the two foods that those people had recommended to me, garlic and turmeric, are definitely on the list. The type of foods or the what is now a category of foods that those people were referring to are called anti-angiogenesis foods. I will um, put a link um, to some scholarly articles about that down in the description. And uh, I thank the people that, that brought those, brought those um, foods to my attention um, and, and, and recommended them as well and said, hey, I did take this and it did help. Um, I, I do thank you for that. That was lovely. Um, and what, particularly what I liked about it was because I'm a man of science and because I was able to find actual scientific scholarly articles that, that confirmed uh, what was being recommended to me. It had extra weight for me when I was considering it. So just to let you know, I was not only already aware of um, turmeric, I actually already had some in the cupboard because um, it, it's, I'd known for some time that it had anti-inflammatory properties and I had been taking it. Uh, and because of the way the body uptakes um, curcumin, which is the active ingredient in turmeric, um, it's often um, tied in with black pepper. So I already had um, some of those available to me and I have um, gone back on them, basically. You just take a tablet or two a day, it's, it's no big deal. But um, um, turmeric contains curcumin and curcumin is known uh, for its anti-inflammatory and now anti-cancer properties. Um, so I thank the people that um, brought those to my attention. Um, I am also a, uh, an etymologist and a writer. So I do want to point out that the word is turmeric with, with T-U-R. It's not turmeric. Uh, the word turmeric seems to be um, out there somehow. Um, the word is actually turmeric, um, T-U-R. So I want to thank those people. Uh, and you have changed my um, regimen. And I do believe you've changed my regimen for the better. The second uh, person, and this is a specific person, and this person knows who they are. I won't name them, although... Um, I feel like I should because they deserve to be called out. But um, one of you made me aware of a group called PMP Pals and their website is pmppals.net. They uh, are an American or a US-based um, group, uh, support group for people specifically with um, my type of what is a very rare cancer. It's roughly a one in a million per year cancer and they have a support group for that and um, I have joined and last night, oh, sorry I should say um, very early this morning, 6am this morning, was actually the first um, Zoom call, support call. I did attend it so I stayed up all night uh, just because of the way um, I, I ended up having a nap yesterday afternoon so that meant that I ended up making the decision to stay up all night until 6 a.m. to attend this meeting from 6 a.m. until 7.30 a.m. my time. Excuse me, my time. Um, I did do that and it was absolutely well worth it. So I am now already connected with, uh, I, I didn't count exactly, but I, got, I would estimate that there were 12 people on the Zoom call and um, we are either all um, PMP positive or we are carers for people that are PMP positive. And I was the youngest um, or the most recent attendee. I was there on my first meeting. I do recall there was one guy there that was on their second meeting and there were certainly some people there. Um, I think one of the ladies indicated she had been there 
at least five years, if not 10 years. So uh, it was, it was, there's a wonderful mix of, um, of new people and old people. And there were very clearly um, survival stories. So that was very good for me to, to visualise, to see these are all people that have survived it. These are all people that can give me very useful, uh, relevant information going forwards. So I have hooked up with uh, a support group that I believe is uh, highly relevant and will be of a great assistance to me um, in my battle. Uh, and given the rarity of my battle, uh, I'm very thankful that PMP, uh, uh, pmppals.net does exist. And I'm very grateful to those people that have been long-termers, that have been there for 10 years and they're now completely in remission and they don't need to be there for advice to beat it because by all accounts they've already beaten it or at least they've already gained all the information they need to do their optimal job of beating it and yet they still turn up. So uh, that is lovely and I do, I do thank those people for, for running that organisation. So I, I just wanted to do a quick one today because um, I'm, I'm lacking in sleep because of, because of how last night played out. So that's pretty much uh, the main part of what I wanted to say. So in summary, I am now taking a dietary supplement and I am now hooked up with uh, a support agency that is absolutely specific to the type of cancer I have and, um, and has a wealth of information. Tomorrow's post will probably... Uh, be about my visit to Fiona Stanley because I'm visiting Fiona Stanley Hospital tomorrow. I'm due for an ascites drain. Um, I, I, I won't stand up and pull up pull up my shirt to show you. Oh, maybe I will. What the heck, hey? It's just I'm in an awkward spot, but I can probably work it out. Let's go back about here. I'll get my I'll get my head in. Okay, so that's my belly at the moment. And uh, as you can tell, I'll just see if, is that, is that better? Does that have a better background? Uh, so that's me at the moment. So I am quite distended. Uh, I, I promise you there is, I can feel the pain building again. Um, for those of you that, that have ascites or have um, had ascites in the past, you'll know that after you've had the drain, you're virtually pain free and over time the pain builds up. And I did have a moment in my sleep last night where I woke up um, with that acute uh, breakthrough pain and I was you know, grabbing my belly and, and thinking, crikey, I'm so glad I've got a, got a drain on Friday. So that did happen yesterday. So my, my next uh, post will be, um, tomorrow's post is gonna be about whatever happens at Fiona Stanley. And um, thank you for staying with me on the journey. I am, I am feeling the love. And I'm also feeling the anti-troll uh, um, resistance so thank you for that as well um don't worry we are winning that battle the uh the trolls are not mentally uh overcoming me at all and the trolls by the way were only really um picking on me over one specific thing that i'm actually quite resolved with in my mind so um they, they certainly weren't pushing a hot button topic for me that i was uh unprepared to to let you know how i feel about so everything's fine uh, and, um, and good going forward. And it's in a big part to you, okay? So thank you so much. Just before I leave this park, I wanna tell you a little bit about it. This is Wireless Hill Park in um, Perth. If you Google or get Google Maps and type in uh, Wireless Hill Park, Western Australia or Perth, you will find it. It's got significance to me because my father was a uh, telecoms technician. The actual company he worked for, which was a government agency, at the time was called Postmaster General. It later became called Telecom, and Telecom later became Telstra. And then Telstra was sold off from, I think actually when it was Telecom, it was sold off, uh, as from being a government um, agency to being a private enterprise. And for those of you that don't live in Australia, um, if you live in America, for example, it's the equivalent of possibly AT&T, is who my father used to work for. This place here, Wireless Hill Park, is called Wireless Hill because there used to be a, an enormous wireless uh, antenna here and it was uh, a base of communications for the, uh, the city of Perth when Perth was a very small city. So my father, and my father, I do remember my father talking about this place because as I'm about to show you when I walk around, there's a little museum here with, um, 
things to do with the early days of um, HF and ham radio and and, um, and shortwave radio and what have you. And my, my father actually loved this place. So um, it feels good to me for that. I also want to uh, acknowledge the Indigenous uh, Australians, and in particular the Indigenous people of this land, the Wadjuk land. Uh, <laughs> whew, that hit. Um, they, they were here first, and there are a number of um, uh, installations here that acknowledge the first peoples of, um, of Australia and the first peoples of Western Australia and the first peoples of Wadjuk, the Wadjuk land, and um, that this was a sacred place for the Wadjuk. Um, uh, hopefully I'll find something that'll tell that story, uh, but be only because I'm, I'm ignorant to to tell it with confidence to you right now. But, I, but what I do remember is that it's a sacred place for them. It is the highest piece of land in the area. So not, it's not surprising that uh, the Indigenous people would find it sacred for its, its location and its ability to look out over the land. Uh, so, whew, it's, um, sorry, I, I didn't expect to get emotional there. I do deeply respect the um, First Nations people of this country. I do, do also hold a little bit of um, what I'd describe as um, in, almost embarrassment for being um, European, if I'm honest. Um, but, but not that I was one of the first settlers and not that I did any of these horrible things to the, to the First Nations people, but um, I would express to you that I do at times feel a bit of, um, a bit of sadness for being European and um, acknowledging the fact that Europeans did such horrible things to them. And I would also say that um, when I did my DNA ancestry, uh, which, which I'll talk about on another day, I was a little sad that I didn't have any Indigenous heritage in me. I was pretty sure I didn't uh, because I was pretty sure I do know my family tree back to um, before European settlement of Australia. I, I, I do want to express though that a little bit of me was hoping that I was part Indigenous and that I could, I could biologically claim a connection to this land um, over and above the way that I, I, I feel an inherent um, connection to this land. So I'll walk around um, Wireless Hill Park. Like I said, if you want to go on Google, Google Maps and look it up, that's where I am right now. So enjoy these, um, this trailer here and uh, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. See you later. I dare say that this little piece of walkway here that um, looks like it is lined by snakes is no coincidence. There are many Indigenous Australian Dreamtime stories that talk about um, magical snakes and I dare say that this is not a, a coincidence. So there you go. And that's the background of... Um, where I shot the original video. I'll just walk around it uh, for you. Ah, oh, here we go. Here's some, here's some of the Noongar. Just to explain to those of you that aren't um, Australian or maybe aren't West Australian, uh, you'll, you'll see, if, if, I, if I zoom up there, that language there is the Noongar language, which is the, and the Noongars are uh, an Aboriginal, I don't know if the right word is, is tribe, but um, they're certainly the group of Indigenous Australians that are in the Perth area. Oh, sorry, in the wet, in the southwestern Australia area, the lo the very local tribe is the Wajuk tribe. So you can see there, uh, Kaya Nunuk Wabin Nid Nid Nidja is hello. You play here, and down here you can see uh, Jurabini. Uh, Buja is happy place. So um, I, I find it really nice that in recent times, uh, I, I can certainly speak for Western Australia. Western Australia has embraced um, Indigenous culture and an Indigenous pride, I would describe, in a way that it wasn't before. And I, I'm very proud of it. I don't think it's unique to Western Australia. I can tell that it's happening all over Australia because uh, in particular through the AFL, the Australian Football League, uh, I'm a big AFL fan and we have a week called um, Indigenous Week or Indigenous Round, I should say, sorry, where we have the Welcome to Country um, 
uh, ceremonies, which is a smoking ceremony where, where they burn, I think, eucalyptus leaves and there um, is a gifts are exchanged. And it's basically a way of saying, we welcome you and, and uh, we welcome you to this land that you're about to play football on. That, that's become a feature of AFL football. And I think that's lovely. What I'm showing you there is one of the bases of, there are three bases. I might as well walk around to all three and just show you. This here, which is a now a, an observation tower, is one of the bases for three uh, what would have been sets of high tension um, lines to hold up a mast in the middle. So if I, if I scoot around to the left here, I'll show you that the wires, the high tension wires would have come out of that section there. And if I scroll around to there and I'll just try and zoom in on that. I'll just see if I can do a nice gentle zoom for you. That there is the second base station and oops, sorry, sorry for doing a heck of a pan on you there. The third one, um, it's obscured at the moment, but it would be over there somewhere. And the centre of those is going to be somewhere over here. I'll see if I can find where the old base of the um, mast must have been, but it'll be, over, it'll be over there somewhere. So just to zoom right out. So this is Wireless Hill Park. Over here uh, is a tribute to the Anzacs. Now, for those of you that don't know who the Anzacs are, I, I, I want to educate you on that. ANZAC is A-N-Z-A-C. It stands for Australia and New Zealand Army Corps. And the story there is that Australia and New Zealand, we are brothers. We are both Commonwealth countries and we fight together, we die together, and we also celebrate together. So you'll never see two countries that are as, uh, as close as Australia and New Zealand. And this here is a memorial to them. And when you get the angle just right, it is a, uh, a picture of the, of the field. If I get down here somewhere, if you line it up just right. I think, oh, hang on, I must have to go backwards or forwards. There's a point that you can stand where all of these actually line up. Uh, anyway, you get, you get the point. And this is to honour the service and sacrifice of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps um, during the First World War. So you can see that, that these guys here are in uh, First World War um, garb. And if I go over to the middle of the, um, the, middle of the installation, uh, MN might is a, now that one I'm not certain of. The other three I am, let's see if I can work it out. That one's obviously the Australian Air Force. That one is the Australian Army. And this one is the Australian Navy. I, I may have misspoken before, actually. This may not specifically be a, um, an Anzac Memorial. It may, it may actually be just an Australian Army one. Oh, no. I, well, OK, this is certainly uh, one of the prayers that we say on Anzac Day, um, they, which is... They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Um, I look. That's. I will. I will post that up. I, I. I wish I could remember off the top of my head. Um, but this is a famous poem that is said um, on Anzac Day, and I will. I will grab it for you. I would read it. I would read it out to you, except that part of the installation is that they have. Um, uh, to make it into the shape of the soldier, they have left out some key, key words. Oh, there we go. No, no, it is there. Because that S goes up with that hell. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. They mingle not with their laughing comrades again, they sit no more at, at the f familiar tables of home. They have not, they have no lot in our labour of the day, time, the sleep beyond England's 
foam, I think, but where our desire, where our desires are and our hopes are found, felt as a well, as a wellspring that is hidden from sight for the, hidden in sight from, to the innermost heart of their own land. And they are known as the stars are known to the night as the star, uh, they are known, let me start, say that again, because that actually sounds really nice. They are known as the stars are known to the night as the, as the stars that shall be bright when we are dust, moving in marches upon the heavenly plains as the stars that are starry in the time of our dark darkness to the end, to the end, they remain forever. Uh, Robert, Robert Orr, is it? And then, um, or, oh, Robert Lawrence, that's it. Robert Lawrence, Bin, Bin your, Bin your. Look, um, I, I did a, um, a poor job of that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna find that actual poem and I'm gonna post a link to it below I do know that that is a poem that we say on Anzac Day so um, it certainly is an Anzac memorial I'm, I'm just not sure why we only had the um, the Australian services listed there so okay I've found another key landmark so I'll take you over to that over here is the center so I, I recognize these uh, the these cement blocks here. This is where the central the central mast was. So this will be the centre point where those three towers converge. <coughs> and I can confirm for you, even in this high place where I am standing now, is the high place of the high place. So the centre of these three blocks. And actually, you, you can even see the old, that the cement is different there. That is where the centre of the old, um, the old radio tower would have been. And there, by the way, is the third base, base station or base mounting point. So there you go. So there's the three of them. This over here is uh, what has become the the uh, museum. I will zoom in, uh, show you that. I won't. I won't um, stay on it. But if you if you want to pause that and read it, you're most welcome to. That's probably about as that there would be as probably about as far as I can zoom in. So if you want to read that, um, you're most welcome. And this this here is another one that's that's nearby. Over here is an entrance to the to the museum, and uh, I'll just see whether I can I'll just see whether I can say hi. There's the sign that tells me that uh, the museum is open. So there we go. Wednesday to Sunday, ten till four. So I am within the the range of Wednesday to Sunday, ten uh, ten a.m. till four. So. This is the little Wireless Hill um, Museum. So there's a little diorama showing, showing the radio mast and, and where it was in relationship to everything back in the day. There's a little uh, Morse code sender. I recognise that because my dad used to send a lot of uh, Morse code. He used to, that, that was dad's idea of fun actually. Um, there was a Morse code club once a week and um, Dad used to send Morse code to, to his mates around the world. And um, he had one of those and I was, I was very aware of what it was. So I won't read that out, but if you want to pause it and read it, you're welcome to. So over here, there, there looks like there's a bit of a discussion on, well, those are certainly radio valves. I recognise those because my dad um, had plenty of them. And these look like some very old radios, pretty cool radios too, I would say. Um, yeah, so, so that's nice. And, and actually it continues uh, with 
uh, more transistors. So I don't know. If, I don't know if you could be able to read that or not. But um, if you want to pause it and read it, then that's probably enough footage for you to do that. And there's some more valves there, and um, and it looks like an old radio set, and some pretty cool old radios from what looked like um, the 60s and 70s. So, so that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, there we go. And up here we have a timeline showing the, the history of this site, uh, well, certainly the European history of this site. I can see it starts at 1894. So it doesn't talk about the Indigenous Australians, it only talks about the Europeans. Over here, we've got some really big uh, valves, and Radiotron is a uh, that is a brand that I recognise because my father used to have uh, quite a few valves in his uh, in his workshop that were Radiotron branded. So my dad would be able to tell you something about that box right there. I unfortunately um, am am naive to it, but my dad would certainly have been able to tell you something quite quite interesting about it. That's the kind of guy Dad was. And we've got some more, more radios there. So it's it's a small museum, but it is got some it has got some really cool stuff in it and definitely stuff that's um, valid to the topic and certainly stuff that reminds me of um, of my father because my father was a radio tech and um, I'm pretty happy with it. So there you go. Guys, I'm just going to introduce you to this lovely lady here, Megan. And Megan heard me walking out the door and noted that I had said something incorrect. So Megan is now going to come over and correct me on the timeline over here because it's not what I thought. Megan, over to you. Yeah, sure. Um, so the timeline itself is from the history of radios because uh, the site itself was built in 1912, not um, 1894. If you, if you just go through it quickly and... Uh... Um, well, this is just, just the technical milestones of um, radio. So, start off by the... You've got your light bulbs, and then I guess you see, get your tubes. <laughs> yeah, my dad... Get your valves. Yeah, this is... My, my dad was a tube and valve guy, so uh, yeah. I definitely understand that. Yeah, and then it goes all the way on from valves into... Um... Well, let's go through it. Let, let's let's do it. So, we've got, um, so we've got vacuum valves. Vacuum valves, yeah. Um, shore to ship radio. Yeah, this is where this um, building was built. It was built by the German company Telefunken. Uh, okay, and uh, let me think. The First World War was nineteen fourteen. Yes. So, so it was it was made, made in, in preparation. No, no. Built in nineteen twelve um, by a German company because. Oh, Germans! Needed, yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. The Telefunken does. Because yeah. Because they needed um, radio connectivity in okay. Australia. Okay, and I, I wonder how they felt about it when uh, two years later yeah, we were using um, it against them. I think to um, the army took control uh, of this site. Okay, thank you. That's that's really interesting. Now let's go to 1913 and see what happened there. Yeah, well, um, Regenerative radio frequency amplifier uh, by Ed, Edwin Armstrong. I uh, don't know much about that. I don't. <laughs> yeah, good, me either. Um, ni 1924, we've got the 6WF radio station oh, um, yeah, started. That was the um, Perth radio station, I'm pretty sure. That, ah, okay. Oh, yeah, I recognise 6WF as being... Okay, so do you want to carry on from 1925? Uh, sure, then we have our first Yep, uh, first practical television by John Logie Baird. Um, for those of you that aren't Australian, um, no, the name Logie, <laughs> yeah, the Logie Awards, yeah. We have a, um, an award in Australia called the Logie Awards, mm -hmm. and it's an award for excellence in television. Mm -hmm. And even though John Logie Baird, I think, was British... We have it as an Australian award, and it's to honour the, invent the inventor of, um, of television. Yeah. Um, so, so do you want to go on with 1929? Uh, sure, then we have the first public television broadcast, uh, yep. BBC. Yep. Then we have Radar. Radar, okay. So that's, that was a huge invention, and yeah. it came in, as it, as it turned out, one year before the start of World War Two, which mm -hmm. obviously was a great time for, it, yeah. for, the, for the Allies anyway. Yeah, now we have the walkie-talkies. Yep, so I used to use that, them as a kid, and I noticed it's Motorola, which is a company that uh, they now make mobile phones. Yeah. Um, so they've, they're obviously a very old like company. Motorola. 
your phone was. Yeah, it's funny you say it. was because um, I remember a time when Motorola was very, very popular, oh. and nowadays they've almost no, completely I, gone. No, it was, the Motorola was my first phone. Um, right, right. 2017. Oh, 2017. Okay, there we go. Thank you for that. We, we should probably put that on yeah. the uh, on the time board here. Yeah. Uh, so 1947. I, I, back to you. Yeah. Transistors, okay, so that means um, the valves, which are a... Um, yeah, so instead of being... Um, and uh, Transistors are still a solid-state product, mm -hmm. but instead of using um, valves that have um, gas in them, you're now going to a solid-state transistor. So the gas part of it, or the vacuum part of it, is now no longer, no longer part of the picture. Back to you, 1954. We have the portable transistor radio. Yep, so portable transistor radio. And if you remember in the footage earlier, we showed quite a few examples of those. And you might remember I said they looked like they were from sort of 1950, 1960, 1970. Mm -hmm. That explains why, because they were actually invented yeah. in 1954. Do you have a bit of paper that has some information about the specific radios? Oh, okay. Perhaps you could, you could quickly show us that later. Yeah, that later. Yeah. 1956. Oh, then we have... First television broadcast in Australia. Okay, so for the Australians out there, if it ever comes up in a pub quiz, 1956, first television broadcast in Australia, and I see that it was Channel 9. Mm. So um, actually, that's, that makes sense because it's Channel 9 that actually has the Logie Awards. So that makes sense. They were the first channel in Australia, and they honour the first inventor of TV. Over to you for 1958. Um, first integrated circuit. Okay, first IC. Now, I'm, as you would know, I ended up working in IT. So 1958 is probably where my dad's story and my story start to come together because whilst dad was mainly into radios, I was mainly into things that had to do with integrated circuits. 1958 is also, I think, when my granddad was radio operator on a merchant navy. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> okay, do you want to name check him? Do you want to call no, his name? No. Okay. <laughs> Yep, that's it's cool. That's fine, okay. Well, I'll give you a link to this, and if you want to send this off to your granddad, just quietly, <laughs> you're, you're welcome to. The offer's there if you want it anyway. So, so, uh, yeah, okay. So, 1960 is transistors, 1970s is integrated circuits, 1971 is microprocessor by the famous company Intel. And uh, Intel is a company that um, obviously influenced my life because the very earliest computers that I was working on had the Intel 8080 processor and later the 8088 processor. And for those of you that are familiar with the 286, 386, pen, um, pen, uh, 486 and Pentium, those are all Intel chips. So uh, from 1971 onwards, um, you've got that microprocessor from Intel. So back to you with 75. Uh, portable computers. 1975, first portable computers. Um, I dealt with some of the first early portable computers and I can tell you they were quite large. Um, the word portable is, um, is, is a little bit not correct. Uh, it says 20 kilos. That's a oh, tw uh, uh, yeah, so, so there we go. Um, they, are, they were portable, but they were 20 kilos. Okay, over to you for the rest of 75. Uh, colour television in Perth. Colour television in Perth. Okay, I was born in 1970, so I was five years old at that time. <laughs> I don't specifically remember um, the first uh, colour show, but because of research I've done, I... My recollection is it was a show called Auntie Jack, and um, I may even find a link to that and put it in the description for you. Okay, you're 1978. Our first car to use an integrated circuit. First car to use integrated circuits by um, GMC, and it says here the Cadillac Seville was the first car to use an integrated circuit for its trip recorder. So that is interesting. So that means computers have been in cars since 1978. And for those of you that, that watch my uh, car videos on the Mazda 3, you would know that vehicles now have um, at least five different computers in them. So the very first one started in 1978. So over to you for 79. We have the Walkman cassette player. Walkman cassette player. Okay, this takes me back to my childhood because I used to have one of these. Um, I used to listen to... Um, who did I have? There was... Uh, um, Thomas Dolby, I used to have a cassette, I used to listen to Walkman with, with him. Um, there was The Models, which is a good Australian band that I highly recommend to you, but back from in the day. And um, I think that might have even been when I had Aerosmith and Run DMC and those guys playing in my ears. But that was certainly um, with a Walkman cassette player. And I noticed there that it says the brand is Sony. And funnily enough, the Walkman player I had definitely was Sony. Okay, and over to you for the last one. Uh, we have um, First Portable Computer. 
First portable computer. Hang on, we had that one before. Yeah, we had, but this is probably um, first fully contained. That's what it's. Oh, uh, okay. First fully contained. Um, oh, I guess. Not port- a twenty kilo. <laughs> yeah, not not twenty kilo. And if it's fully contained, that might even mean that it's one unit instead yeah. of several pieces. I'd like to say thank you to you for contributing. Um, You're very welcome. Uh, so just just to let you know, I'm at the Wireless Hill. Wireless um, Hill Museum. Yeah. Okay. And what are your opening hours? Uh, Wednesday to uh, Sunday, 10 to 4. 10 to, okay, so there you go. Those are the opening hours. And if you're coming to visit Perth, please do consider this. I, even though I've shown you around, you've seen a lot of it. Oh. Come and experience it for yourself. Uh, this specific exhibit is only here until October 8th. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, and then that's great. Close down and have new stuff coming up. So all of the exhibits oh. are here are temporary. Oh, is that, has that always been the case? Uh, yes, it has. Actually, now that I think about that, last time these... The last time I was here, it was something else because I don't recall any of these yeah. exhibits. And actually, now that I remember, because my father, when he passed away, he don't well, I donated on yeah. his behalf a heap of Dad's old radio stuff yeah. to you. Huh? So some of the stuff that you will occasionally put on display, and I don't even know that some of these um, valves that you have on display right now... It might be or might be in our um, conservation room. Are, or... are actually, yeah, but they're actually from my father. Oh, yeah. So yeah. there you go. So thank you very much. You're um, welcome. Uh, what was just remind me of your name again? Uh, Megan. Megan, I want to say thank you to you, and all of my viewers want to say thank you to you for for showing us around. Thank you very much, Megan. All right, cheers. See you later. I'm sure some of you are the type of people that stop at each of these and like to read them. So, in case you are one of these people, um, what I'll do is I'll zoom in on um, several of them, and if you want to pause it there and read it, then you're most welcome to. So, there's one. And over here, we've got another one. So that's another one there. So if you want to read that one, then um, there you go. I should also call out my council, which is the city of Melville. Um, So I do want to say thank you to the city of Melville. What you've done here is absolutely beautiful. Um, I think it's it's conserving the, both the European history and the, um, the Indigenous Australian history, and I think you've done a really good job. So, so thank you to the City of Melville for this. I'm going to walk over to one particular corner because uh, when I've walked around here, I know that there's some signs that are to do with the Wajuk seasons, and I'm really keen to show you that um, there is... Oh, here we go. This one is actually to do with um, the, the Noongar and the Wajuk here. So... I'll just read, read part of this out to you, because I think it's really cool. Yagan's Lookout, which is Wireless Hill, has always been a significant place for communication. The importance of hills in communication is vital. The highest level of communication for a group of Aboriginal people that were closely related as one blood called Jarnagup. Some of the young people that were learning this lived in Mia Mia's, which is a hut constructed on the east side, constructed on the east side. Noongar people would not go under the under the cool, which are the she oak trees, when it was windy. If they had done something wrong, the cool tree is judge and jury. The first thing to become real and move across the land was wagle, which is oh uh, sorry, uh, that's pronounced woggle. I know that word actually, and that means serpent. So what what we saw in that previous um, bit of footage that that was obviously a represent representation of woggle. Um, He was the first to defy the heavy sky that sat on the land and became real. And as he moved across the land, he pushed up the hills and the valleys. There was nothing on the land before that. It was flat and featureless. Wireless Hill fits in with a second level of in the dreaming. The animals, which are the the Ningan, oh, sorry, the animal Ningan, which is an echidna, and the Kata, which is the Goanna. Those two always travel together, and wherever they go, they represent the spirit of those who passed on. So they're very, very important to dreaming. And that is attributed to who is, who, um, is a Noongar elder. I should point out um, that within Noongar culture, to speak the name of, of those passed away is, is, um, is, is all but taboo. So um, I will... When I will go back, I will take out the audio of that person's name that I that I called out um, in respect to the Indigenous um, people. What I'll do now is I'll walk over to this 
uh, what, it, what is one of the old base stations, but it is now a lookout. So I'll walk over there and then I'll walk up the top and I'll show you the vista from the top there. So we, we'll be able to see all the way to Perth from the, from the top of this lookout. So stick with me. I'm on. Play, play some walking music if you've got some walking music going on. As I recall, the base of the stairs is actually on this side. Okay, so up we go. Now I'll just watch where my feet are going, so I'm not sure where the camera will go. So here we are. So this is the top. So if I slowly pan around to the right, that there is Perth City. So that is the CBD. So you can see those are the high rises there. Back in the day when I used to work for the health department, I was um, in one of those buildings. So that's Perth. Heading over this way, we're looking at South Perth and Applecross. And Ardross is over that way, so I live over towards where the camera is pointing now. My house is over there somewhere. There's the museum that we were in earlier. There's a, oh, that's a black cockatoo. Let me, let me zoom in on that black cockatoo. That there is, that's a black cockatoo. Um, they're very, very noisy. And, um, and I love them. They, uh, they're a noisy, bo boisterous bird, and um, I, I respect their moxie, shall we say. Oh, actually, that's an interesting point. Um, look, it used to be a telecommunications um, centre, this place, and it actually still is. So those there are Telstra and uh, Vodafone and Optus towers for mobile phones nowadays, because, of course, this still is the high point of the area, so it still is a very good place to stick an antenna. So even today, it is being used as a, um, a telecoms spot. So at the moment, I'm pointing over towards Atterdale and Bicton. So if you're looking on Google Maps, then um, I'm now pointing out towards the west. And out towards the west of me is Atterdale and Bicton and Alfred Cove. That, that's probably Alfred Cove actually there, that little, that little inlet there. And on the other side of the river, you would have... Um, the fancy suburbs of Dalkeith and what have you. I can actually see, I'll, I don't know how much I can zoom in, but there's actually a yacht club just there. So that'll be the South, um, the Royal Perth um, Yacht Club, I would say, which is uh, a, a fancy yacht club. Let's, let's just put it that way. And just for those of you that like to read signs, here we go. An aerial view of Melville District, um, the Maradungup, which is Alfred Cove, Dun Duntaboro, which is Melville Waters, Margam Margamangup, which is Lucky Bay, and Durbel Yeren, which is the Swan River. Uh, and the photo was taken from the top of the Wireless Hill Mast circa 1935 and has been hand, hand coloured. So were I to have done the shot that I did in 1935, it actually would have looked something like this. So as you can see, there's um, it's bushland. There's there's no there's no um, houses. So 1935, it was it was bushland. So and as you remember, I think I think uh, from that um, from that museum, I think it was 1912 that the um, uh, wireless mask I put here so and that picture there was from 1935 so it's still very much um, bushland when um, when, it, when, it, when it was installed surrounding the wireless hill park are lots of walkways so if I show you there that's a walkway that that goes off back to suburbia and what they've done is in the walkways they have put uh, signboards that 
are almost always to do with Indigenous um, Australians. I found the signboard that I'm looking for, and it's that one there. I'm very sad to report that it um, has been graffitied on, which is upsetting to me, but I'm not going to let it um, derail what I'm about to show you. As I, as I walk towards this sign, I want to let you know that Europeans have only ever acknowledged four seasons, being um, summer, autumn, winter and spring. And the, the, the Noongar people or the, or the Indigenous Australians in general, rather than four, they, they recognise six seasons. And I put, the, I put that down to them being more connected to the land and more uh, observant of the little subtle changes uh, in the land as you go through the various seasons. So please ignore those wankers that have put um, uh, graffiti on there. And if you'd like to freeze frame that and read it, then I know this sign quite well. I've, I've read it several times. And what it does is it talks about the six different seasons. So if you want to freeze frame that, and uh, read it. That's what that talks about. So thank you very much for watching Cancer Update 17. It's been my pleasure to deliver it to you. Um, and it's a pleasure to show you how beautiful Perth is um, from another vista. So um, yesterday we, we did one vista at Shirley Strict on the Reserve. And today we're doing it from another vista at Wireless, um, Wireless Park Hill, Wireless Hill Park. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'll be talking to you probably tomorrow when I go to Fiona Stanley Hospital for a drain. So, thank you. Hello, Cocky. Hello. Hello there. Hey. Dance, Cocky. Oh, there we go.